Welcome to another episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scribner. In each episode, I sit down with someone in the top 1% of their profession to decode what they've mastered and what they've learned along the way, diving deep to uncover the tools, habits, and ideas that we can all apply in our own lives. And today I'm talking with Paula Ferris. Paula has been an anchor on Good Morning America and The View. She's also an Emmy Award-winning journalist who's worked as senior national correspondent for ABC News, where she's interviewed people like Hillary Clinton, Tiger Woods, and Reese Witherspoon. In 2018, she launched her own faith-focused podcast with ABC called Journeys of Faith with Paula Ferris. On Journeys of Faith, she's interviewed high-profile political leaders like Nikki Haley and Cory Booker. She's interviewed athletes like Tim Tebow. And she's explored the topic of faith with pronounced atheists like Sam Harris. And it's because of this incredibly open dialogue, which I think is missing today, that I wanted to have her on Outliers for a conversation about faith. In this episode, we cover Paula's career as a journalist, her journeys with her own faith, and what she's learned discussing faith with high-profile figures from around the world. Paula's new book, Called Out, Why I Traded Two Dream Jobs for a Life of True Calling, is out now. And in it, she shares what she's learned grappling with the difference between her career and her calling. As always, you can find the show notes and full transcript for this episode at danielscrivener.com. And with that, please enjoy my conversation with Paula Ferris. Okay, so we have a huge treat today, and we're lucky enough to have Paula Ferris joining us on the podcast. Paula Ferris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to have you. I've been preparing for this for quite a while. So one of the places I wanted to start, you know, this episode, we're going to really focus in on and talk about your experience with faith, the book that you recently published called out and your challenges and your struggles over time with work versus worth and calling versus career and some of those struggles. But maybe where I wanted to start is if you could just share a little bit about your own personal journey with faith and where you feel like that started in your life. For sure. But before we proceed, I want to give everybody listening a little bit of color as to what's going on between Daniel and I right now. So Daniel has these earbuds in that make him look like he could break out into some sort of like rock song at any moment, pulling his guitar out. Yes, exactly. And I have to say, I've done hundreds of podcasts and yours is the first where you actually send, you sent me a headset. So I'm wearing what looks like a gaming headset. (laughs) It is a gaming headset. It's a gaming headset right now, just to ensure that the quality, the audio quality is good. So it comes in the mail yesterday and my son's like, mom, why did you order a gaming headset? And I was trying to explain to him that it's for your podcast. He's like, can we keep it? Can we buy it from him? So anyway, I'm not sure if I'm actually doing a podcast or if I'm supposed to go play Xbox with my son. We're on Twitch. We're on Twitch right now. (laughs) <laughs> We're on Twitch right now, but I look like I'm either doing a podcast or playing Fortnite with my son uh, wearing this gaming headset. My husband walked in a moment ago and he said, good luck landing the planes. So there's also throw that into the equation. I look like I'm an air traffic control. Just to redeem myself, it looks totally ridiculous, <laughs> but we've we've tried out so many of these and we found that it's helpful. But yes, it is a gaming headset. It is a little bit of an aggressive ask, but <laughs> thank you for it. No, but I have to say... I appreciate it. And I think that's what sets you apart already from other ho. And my son thinks you're awesome, by the way. This guy sends gaming headsets to everybody. So until he sees what you're doing, then he's very bored. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he thinks it's cool. But hey, if it improves the audio quality, then I'm all for it. So to answer your question, Danielle, my faith journey, I say I'm a, I'm a Christian mutt for all intents and purposes. So I grew up in Jackson, Michigan, in the Midwest. I'm a Midwest kid. And my parents had kind of found their faith in their 40s, late 30s and 40s. So I had my first communion in the Catholic church, and then we switched to the Lutheran church. And then I went to a Baptist high school, and then I went to a Bible, very strict Bible college. And then along the way, the common denominator throughout my entire childhood, my parents belonged to this ecumenical group called Morning Star Christian Community. I know it sounds like, what is that, a cult? No, it wasn't a cult. It was born out of the charismatic Catholic renewal in the 60s and 70s. So we met at the local YMCA and different you know, families from all over Jackson County, which is where I'm from, Jackson, Michigan. We had our respective churches, and then we met 
separately with Morningstar Christian Community. So you had Catholics, you had Baptists, you had Episcopalians, you had Lutherans, and we met separate from our churches on Sunday nights, very Pentecostal. And then we would have what we would refer to as small groups on Saturday nights. We would have break out into small groups. We call those households. I've kind of seen it all. So I try not to get hung up on the minute differences between a lot of the denominations having been Catholic and Lutheran, Baptist and Bible and Pentecostal. And now I go to a non-denominational church. I think at the end of the day, what really matters is, you know, if you're a Christian, they'll know you're Christian by your love for people, all people. So I try not to get hung up on the differences. But yeah, I'm a Christian mutt. That's basically how I refer to myself. One of the things that I wanted to talk about is all of us have in our faith practices, you know, we have things that we do, kind of rituals that we do. But I think more important than that, or something that I really enjoy is just ways of being, ways that we try to show up in the world, ways that we try to show up in daily life or in interactions with our family or our kids. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, I know you mentioned that you go to a non-denominational church now, but some of those standards you try to hold yourself to and some of the ways you try to show up every single day. Standards, you know, things that I hold myself up to. I don't always live up to those though. But the thing that I really try to aspire to do is to give people as much grace and give myself as much grace as I give other people. I don't want to be judged on my worst day. Just for instance, I had something really embarrassing happen to me a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you've ever sent the wrong message to the wrong text thread on your phone. I did. So I had been Presumably, I thought I was sending a message to my college girlfriends. We have known each other for 25 years. It's like we kind of talk like truckers and sailors to one another. Okay, even though we went to a Christian school, we love each other. Like we know everything about one another. And we were having the funniest conversation on this text thread. And they were asking why I couldn't get together. And I was explaining to them what was happening. We were super busy. But one of my son, my middle child, he has been having basketball tournaments and his coach was scheduling them at the last second. And so I would jokingly sent something to them about, you know, this is why I can't get together because his coach is, continues to schedule these tournaments out of the blue. Well, I accidentally sent that message to a different chain. And the chain that I sent it to was my son's coach and all the parents. <laughs> Ouch. And I literally, I realized it right away. And I was like, oh my gosh, I put my phone in airplane mode, hoping that it didn't go through. And it went through. And it was really embarrassing. I threw my phone down and I walked away. And I was like, I have literally no idea how I'm going to redeem this situation. Because I couldn't just say, oh, I said the wrong thing. Because I followed it up with, hey, by the way, I'm doing CrossFit. So like, clearly I'm talking to my friends. And I just thought, you know what? I told my son what happened. And I said, look, that's probably not the best moment for your mother. Not one of my finer moments. I don't want to be judged in that moment, my entire character, because I know who I am. My friends know who I am. Those who know me know who I am. I don't want that one thing to define me. So guess what? I want to be the type of person that doesn't allow one thing to define others. I want to give other people the same amount of grace that I give myself and give myself the same amount of grace that I'm giving other people and not allowing just that one thing to define that. But it was mortifying and it was embarrassing and it was a great reminder of the type of life that I want to live. I'm a flawed, failed human being. I do stupid stuff. We all do stupid stuff. And I realize that about myself and I realize that about other people. I don't want to be that judgmental person that judges and assassinates somebody's character and judges them on one thing. So I'm just trying to be full of grace for myself and for other people. Which I think is a beautiful thing because that's definitely not very common <laughs> today. I find that it's very, yeah, it's very hard to, I guess, see people doing that. So I think that's a great thing. Yeah, especially with cancel culture. I mean, we're making generalizations and assassinating people's character based on one thing. And it's this high horse mentality. Like, let's get all good off our high horse, okay? Let's think of some really stupid stuff that we've done. Would we want everyone to judge us based upon that one thing? No, we're imperfect human beings. So let's live in that grace, knowing that we're all making mistakes. We're all, it's a journey. Let's embrace the flaws and the failures, the highs and the lows, and extend grace to everybody, including ourselves. Yeah, and I think we're all generally flexing that judgment muscle way more than we're flexing the curiosity muscle of like, rather than trying to understand where the other person's coming from or why do they feel that way or what led them to that point of view, we just jump right to, well, I disagree. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm right and you're wrong. That's true. That's always the next thing. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm going to change your mind. And guess what? We can't agree to disagree. So <laughs> you're a horrible human being. <laughs> so from there, I want to fast forward a little bit. So we talked about some of your earliest experiences with faith. But, you know, part of your story and one reason that I was so excited to have you on and why I feel like this conversation is so topical and timely is I've struggled an immense amount with how much worth to put into my career or the things that I end up doing in the world. And I know that you've had your own similar experience with that. So you start off with this really deep rooting in faith. You then go and become very career driven and kind of lose that and have to rediscover it. Can you talk about that journey a little bit? Yeah, well, I think you're doing something that I've done and that we all fall victim to, and that's we interpret so much of our value and purpose and identity from doing, from what we do. It's one of the first questions that we get asked, what's your name and what do you do for a living? Our children, what do you want to do when you grow up? So if it's not implied, it's explicit in our culture. We have to lean in, we have to find that one thing. And even in church or faith culture, find your purpose and calling. And it's always related to doing, is it not? It's always related to career. You have to find that one thing that you were created to do. So I leaned in really hard. I thought I was here to be a broadcaster. I've been in the field for well over 25 years now. And I leaned in really hard. It was at the top of my game, anchoring Good Morning America weekends and The View, co-hosting The View. And I was leaning into my God-given calling and my purpose. And then I burned out and I sensed that God wanted me to pause and to slow down and to pump the brakes a couple of years ago. And I thought, but wait, didn't you call me to do this? Isn't this the one thing I was supposed to do? So why would I pump the brakes now? And it wasn't until I went through a series of unfortunate events within a small period of time. And I write about it in my book. It was the season of hell where it was unequivocally God was trying to slow me down. I had a miscarriage. I had a concussion at work. I had a head-on car crash, influenza, and then pneumonia within seven months. So I knew God was telling me that I needed to slow down. And if I was too stubborn to slow down, which I was, he was going to slow me down. And so at the height of my career, I I decided to off-ramp for a little bit and to pump the brakes. And it was in that space, Daniel, that I realized I had no idea who I was outside of my job. I had no idea who I was without this title because I had introduced myself and I thought my purpose was to be the best broadcaster that God created me to be. And when that changed, and that inevitably does, we experience vocational shifts. I think the average is five to seven throughout our lifetime. When we experience these shifts and we're so tied to the doing, then we don't know who we are outside of it. And so I had to figure out who I was outside of what I did. And I'm not saying that you can't love what you do. You can absolutely love what you do, but there's a difference between loving what you do and being defined by what you do. Do you know who you are outside of that? I thought I would. I thought I had maintained proudly and haughtily that I could step away and my job didn't define me. I'm defined by who I am, a child of God. But then when the rubber met the road and I stepped away, it wasn't enough just to be a Jesus follower or a wife or a mom. None of that really matters. Like, who am I? I'm not co-host of The View. I'm not the anchor of Good Morning America anymore. What am I now? And it was as if those things did matter. So I went on this journey of trying to find out the parts of me that didn't shift and shake in a crisis, which ironically, I didn't realize the foresight. That's what's happening right now in this pandemic where things have changed so much for all of us. We've experienced loss, whether it's loss of loved ones, whether it's loss of job, loss of finances, our bank account doesn't look the same predictability, (laughs) optimism. (laughs) Everything has changed. And so you realize when you place your significance in something that's inevitably going to shift, whether that is your job, whether that is relationship, whether it's bank account, whether it's status on Instagram, Twitter, when you place your significance in that and it shifts, you're going to have an existential identity crisis. You're going to have a crisis. When your purpose is tied into those things, you're not going to know who you are outside of them when they shift, and they will shift. So I went on this journey to find out who I am outside of what I did. For so long, I was Paula Ferris, the anchor of Good Morning America and co-host of The View. And when that changed, I didn't, I, I, who am I again? So I know who I am, and I know why I'm here. I can love what I do, but that doesn't define me. And I realized in that phase of reflection and self-discovery 
that my worth wasn't work and that my value wasn't vocation and that my calling wasn't just career. And once I released myself from that, it was as if the shackles were off and I gave myself the permission. God gave me the permission to branch out and try new things, to take risks, to press into fear, things that he's put on my heart that maybe I didn't think I was qualified or capable of doing. Just because I a great broadcaster doesn't mean that God can't use those same skills that made me a decent broadcaster, the gifts of curiosity, the gifts of question asking, championing and challenging people all made me an effective broadcaster, but God can use those same gifts in different areas and in different seasons. I don't have to be one thing for the rest of my life. And I thought I did. And so it's freeing. It's as if the shackles are off. I can be used in so many different areas And I'm excited to step into these spaces where I feel I'm being led. I don't really know what it's going to look like, but there's risk involved, change is involved, fear is involved, faith is involved, peace and fear coexist. You know, I can have a peace that I'm supposed to do something. I could be scared as hell about it. So I had to realize fear is normal and um, it's up to me to press into it. But I know now, like when I say, who am I? It's no longer related to the doing. It's I'm Paula. I love Jesus. I'm a mother. I'm curious. I ask questions and I like to champion and challenge people. That's who I am. And guess what? That's never going to change. That's who God created me to be. And God can use that in a myriad of different capacities. So that won't change in crisis, personal crisis or pandemic. And it's amazing just hearing you kind of talk through that because it seems like a big piece of it is not giving so much of your worth to external things or extrinsic things and just going inward. And I think one, really getting to know yourself really well, but then finding those things that you can hold on to that you possess almost completely. Is that what the journey was for you? Is a lot of just kind of distancing yourself from external things? Yes, I think, well, the journey was falling flat on my face, realizing I'd had it all wrong. But I don't fault myself. I don't fault other people for doing it because it's baked into our society. It's baked into our culture. It's baked into our vernacular. Uh, What's your name? What do you do for a living? So it's this expectation that success looks like one thing, okay? And what really helped me was um, during this phase of reflection discovery, I remember doing distinctly this interview with a gentleman who worked for the FBI and I'm sorry, he worked for the CIA and his name was David Shedd. And I had read that he felt called to go into government. And I was like, okay, I'm just sick of people throwing this word around. Like I'm called, what does it even mean to be called? What does it look like? What does it sound like? We throw that word around, calling and purpose. And yet, how do you even define it? How do you describe what it is? And he said something to me that really, it was kind of an aha moment. He said, vocational calling looks like three things. What are you good at? What do you love? And what do trusted people notice you're good at you love? He says, those three things have to line up. So for me, what am I good at? Well, I'm curious. What do I love? I love asking questions. My nickname growing up was Paula 20 questions. Could you imagine how annoying I was, Daniel? And then what a trusted people notice that I'm good at and I love? Well, my high school teacher, drama teacher, Mr. Barsoon, was the first one to really kind of channel that and say, you're curious, you ask questions, you should go into broadcasting. And then my college professors were affirming that too, you should be on air. So what are you good at? What do you love? And what do trusted people notice you're good at and you love? For me, curiosity, asking questions, it just happened to channel into broadcasting. But like peel back the layers of yourself. You're not just an entrepreneur and a CEO. What has made you an effective CEO and entrepreneur? I'll give you an example. My husband... He started out as a college basketball coach, and then he got into real estate, and now he manages a big real estate firm in Manhattan. My husband's gifts are leadership and motivation. And so that initially manifested itself in college basketball when he was the captain of his team, and then when he coached, but when he coached college basketball, and now he manages 200 plus agents in Manhattan. So his gifts of leadership and motivation have allowed him to branch out vocationally in different areas. Because you say, what's the common thread between being in basketball and real estate? Well, coaching, managing, leadership, motivating. But you have to, when you ask yourself those questions, it's not like I'm a great engineer. It's what has made you like peel back those layers a little bit more. Are you, do you like to fix things? Are you a creative person? Are you a loyal person? I have a friend who says she's loyal and encouraging, and those are the things that she's good at. 
and that she loves. And she is a podcaster and an author, and she's also a counselor. So you see how those gifts have manifested itself in different areas. But when you ask yourself what you're good at and what you love and what a trusted people notice you're good at and you love, you have to check all three boxes. A dear friend of mine, I'll give you an example of what it's not. She works in the business space. She honestly should be a consultant. And I have spoken that life into her. I'm like, you're really good at it. Other people have noticed you're good at it. You should be a business consultant. And she said, I don't love it. So she doesn't check that second box. She's good at it. And other people notice she's good at it, but she doesn't love it. What are you good at? What do you love? What do trusted people notice you're good at? You love peel back those layers and ask yourself those questions. And sometimes it helps to have other people, your close friends to answer those questions with you because you're too close to the situation often that you can't see the forest from the trees. And for me, when I first started asking those questions, I'm like, I don't know. But curiosity, is that really a talent and a gift? Yeah, it is. We each have our own superpowers. And once we peel back those layers and we realize how we are uniquely wired, what we're good at, what we love, and what other people notice we're good at and we love, it's really just freeing to see the different ways that those gifts can be used in different seasons, in different capacities as well. We don't have to be one thing for the rest of our life. It's a great tool. And I love the, yeah, it's so simple, so crisp. And I think even just hearing that, you're like, yeah, of course, that sounds like exactly what you would do to try to figure out what that looks like. So one thing I want to just talk about a little bit more, as you describe it, you know, you fell down on your face, had to get back up. From, I guess, the outside looking in, it's not like you just stopped doing anything or you stopped being ambitious. You have a podcast, Journeys in Faith, that I think is incredible. You're, you, know, you're, you have a book out called Out that's doing really, really well. So it seems like, I guess, the kind of follow-up questions I want to ask is, do you feel like, because both of those to me are, they're incredible. They feel like what you were made to do. Do you feel like those things kind of snapped into place once you got that sense of identity? And then the other question I guess I'm curious to dig into is maybe you are giving a little bit less of yourself to those things or you're letting them be, you're not letting them become all consuming, but you're clearly still putting a lot of energy and effort. Can you talk about how that works? How do you maintain that distance, but still, yeah. So yeah, when I decided to pump the brakes a couple of years ago, it's not like I quit my job. I didn't quit my job. My book's not about quitting my job. It's about kind of reinventing yourself, finding out who you are outside of what you do, the parts of you that don't shift and shake and not accepting yourself as this one thing forever and ever and pushing back at society's lies that say, this is your only value. So when I decide to step away from the two dream jobs, I'm stepping into this space of the unknown. I'm meeting with my boss and I just say, I need to get my life back. I'd like to work Monday through Friday. And I was in contract negotiations and they said that they wanted to keep me and they would work with me. So I said, I want to work Monday through Friday. And I really felt I had had this sense that I really needed to launch a faith podcast where people could talk about their different faiths and why they believe what they believe. Because in media, it's one of the first questions that we cut out is if they mention God or Allah or Jesus, you know, we're like, yeah, but we don't care about that. Tell us about that salacious uh, quote that you gave or your game winning touchdown. We don't want to hear about their faith. So I wanted to create a space where we could have respectful conversations of people with newsmakers regarding their faith, why they believe what they believe. So they allowed me to launch that podcast. And then I was just kind of reporting Monday through Friday in a much smaller capacity. So the challenge often, Daniel, we can sense something in our spirit that we need to make a change. We have a piece that we're supposed to make some sort of change, but then we're scared as hell to take the next step because we don't know what it looks like. And that's where faith comes into play. You don't get a sneak peek at the next chapter before you finish writing the one you're in. I knew that I was supposed to obey and I knew I was supposed to pump the brakes. I didn't know what it was going to look like on the other side. I just knew that this is what I was supposed to do. And I knew that I had to press into my own fear. And that's when I realized in that season, you can have a peace in your spirit that you're supposed to do something and you can still be terrified. And that's normal. So often we mistake fear for our intuition. Oh, my intuition is telling me not to do it. No, I had a piece that I was supposed to do it, but I was so terrified because I was scared of what I was walking away from. Who walks away at the height of their career, you know, pumps the brakes at the height of their career. And I was scared of what I was walking into, which was the unknown. But I realized fear is normal. And to get comfortable with that feeling of fear and that it was up to me to press into it. And depending on your faith level, I the verse that really helped me was in Joshua 1.9, where God has called Joshua to take down the city of Jericho. And he asked him to circle. 
But then he says, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged for the Lord your God's with you everywhere you go. So that verse, A, it said, it said, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? So we, we're commanded to be strong. This is a command to step into faith, to press into our fear. God commanded Joshua, he commands us to be strong and courageous. He says, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. So he acknowledges that we're going to be scared, but he commands us to press into it. And then he promises us that he's going to be there, meet us through it. So, so often it's like when your GPS, you know how when you plug directions into your GPS and it doesn't really know where you are. So you're like, okay, but I'm here. Am I supposed to take a left or a right out of here? You just have to start driving and then it'll like reorient you. And you're like, oh, I took the wrong turn. Do you know what I'm saying? Like when you first put the directions in. Every time my wife puts in maps, this is exactly what happens. Okay, <laughs> But that's what it's like. You have to start driving. You have to start moving. You have to take that first step and then things become clear for you. But it's not going to become clear unless you start moving, right? Unless you take that step of faith until you start driving in a direction and then God will say, nope, not here. Or God will say, yep, this is where you're supposed to be going. But you have to take that first step. You have to press into your fear. You have to start moving. And sometimes God just wants to, he wants to either refine you, he wants to test your obedience, but he, he, you have to take a step of faith. It's like Martin Luther King. Faith is taking a step when you can't see the rest of the staircase. You just got to start moving. You have to start moving. So I just realized I had to kind of get used to those two feelings of fear and peace coexisting, that they're not mutually exclusive and there's nothing wrong with me if I feel fear. It's totally normal. Fear is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. I think every successful, quote unquote, successful person has had to press into their fear, has been told one time or another that they were crazy to do something. And it doesn't have to make sense to you. It doesn't have to make sense to other people. I say, if you have a peace about something, you proceed. And if you don't have a peace, then pause. But if you do proceed, expect and anticipate the fear to be present. And then it's up to you to press into it and to move forward. And I still don't know what the next chapter truly looks like. I am going to be taking another leap of faith this fall and doing something that's been on my heart for a long time that I didn't feel I was capable or qualified of doing because I was a broadcaster, right? But I realized God gave me these gifts of curiosity and question asking and championing people. And I want to use those same gifts in a different capacity now. And I'm going to stop buying those lies that I have to be one thing for the rest of my life. And I'm ready to take risk and press into my fear because I have a piece that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I'm going to be proceeding. But it can be scary and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with me if I'm scared about it. I have a piece and I'm moving forward. I love that. It feels like you've got a lot of clarity about how that works. Do you interpret fear more as a test then? Is the fear just fear of the unknown and it's always there? Is it God's way of testing us and seeing if we can overcome this hurdle? That's the thing. Fear is normal. It's just there. It's not, there's nothing wrong with you if you feel fear at all. And I think we just have to get used to that. We have to get used to that feeling. And so often fear is just, you know why fear is there? Because it's trying to paralyze you. It's trying to paralyze you from taking the next steps. It's trying to hold you back. Fear is something that we will all deal with in decisions big and small. One thing that really has helped me to kind of press into it is I just kind of came up with some questions. And it's a mix of like seeing what else is out there and finding out what works for me. But I apply these five questions to my own life and to my own situation, okay? So I just, I name it. What is it that I'm scared of? Okay, what am I scared of? And for me, it's the fear of failure. It's the fear of what people typically are going to think of me, the fear they'll think I was a has-been, that I'm washed up and I'm irrelevant. So it's all these stupid fears, okay? So just articulating it and writing it down. And then the second question I ask myself is, what's the worst thing that can happen? Because so often we think negatively, oh, the worst thing that could happen is that I fail and it doesn't work out and and just list those fears. Then the third question, flip that script around a little bit. What's the best thing that could happen if you step into your fear? We often go negative, go positive. Think about the positive. Think about, oh, if I do step into my fear, well, A, I don't have to regret that I didn't go for it. So that right there is a huge plus. That's a huge positive. The fact that my fear didn't hold me back. For me, that's usually the biggest bonus. And then write down the other positives. What are some of the best things that could happen if I press into my fear? Four, ask yourself, 
name some times, think about some times where you've allowed your fear to paralyze you, whether it was big or small. Like I didn't try out for the high school soccer team. I didn't try out for the tennis team or I didn't go to that meet and greet that I should have got like big and small. And then write down how that made you feel and what you regretted. Okay. And then the fifth question is write down some times, think about some times where you didn't allow your fear to paralyze you. And if you remember how invigorating and confident you felt that you didn't have that regret of not going for it. So I try to ask myself those five questions whenever I'm toiling through something. And it just helps me kind of work it out a little bit. And especially that third question, what's the best thing that could happen? It puts me in a more positive space. So instead of thinking negative, I start thinking about the positive. And the greatest thing that can happen by not allowing your fear to paralyze you is that you don't have the regret of knowing that it paralyzed your destiny, that it clamped you up and that it prevented you from taking that step that you knew you should take. So that really helps me. But I think you have to get used to that feeling of fear and peace kind of coexisting. There's nothing wrong with you when you feel fear. But I always say like the very first step before that, if you have a peace about it and that peace from your spirit that this is what you're supposed to do. And if you do, then proceed and expect and anticipate fear. It doesn't have to make sense to you or anybody else. People might call you crazy. Gosh, I've been called crazy. I was told by an executive that I was crazy for pumping the brakes and that would be a career killer. But get used to that. Get used to those feelings of discomfort. That was a very compassionate thing for that executive to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Very, very. Yes, exactly. Very helpful. Uh, career killer. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for empowering me for trying to establish balance in my life. Yeah, not allowed. No, never. The times are changing though. I think in this moment too, with COVID, it's empowered employees to really say, just because this is the way that it's always been done, it doesn't have to continue to be that way. So champion yourself and advocate for yourself in this moment. Say, just because this is how we've done it, we don't have to continue doing it this way. We can change. We can adapt. It's so funny you bring up that link between fear and that loss of identity and COVID, because I definitely feel like I've seen that in almost everyone that I know is this sense of our lives and what an average day looks like and being in the office and being perceived this way. And now all of a sudden we're all stuck at home. We're all in our home offices. I feel like everyone's had to grapple with that sense of identity and like, who am I? And because it's very different. It's really uncomfortable. We're all kind of out of our comfort zone. But I think it's also, it's kind of a, the great equalizer on uh, this moment where it's exposed so many of our insecurities and our doubts and our flaws where even for me, you know, I, th this is the message of my book. And I can't tell you how many times like I've had to remind myself of the message that I'm preaching about. Like I launched my book, Daniel, in April, like right when the pandemic hit, everything was canceled. My book tour, the book signing, all the big orders from Target and Walmart, all the conferences that were going to order tens of thousands of books, the distribution channels were shut down the main distribution channel in the faith space, the Christian book distributors was shut down April, May, June. So those that pre-ordered my book in March didn't get it till July. There were problems with the audio distribution. And I had to remind myself, is my significance coming from the success of this book? Because guess what? That's going to shift and that's going to shake. I can't allow my significance to come from something that moves. And that was very challenging for me. So it's something that I grappled with and I had to really remind myself. I had to just give it up. And I was like, I knew that I was supposed to write this book. I never wanted to write a book, but I felt when I went through this experience a couple of years ago, and walked away the height of my career and didn't know who I was outside of what I did. I felt like I was supposed to write about it. And so I just had to give that up. I'm the messenger, but God's the carrier and he can get it into the right hands and success God's kingdom doesn't look like success in man's kingdom. So I had to detach myself from the disappointment and from the setbacks and just kind of put it in God's hands. And I truly believe I'm one of those people, like, I believe everything happens for a reason. I don't have any regrets, even though I've done some stupid stuff in my life, like really dumb things. I wouldn't take it back because I've learned more from my flaws and failures than I have from the quote unquote successes of life. Those have been the character builders. Yeah, some things you have to learn by painful experience. And oftentimes that's the best way to learn the lesson because then it's kind of branded super deeply. <laughs> you have this touchstone moment or memory that you can think about. Yeah. Oh, I have a scar from that. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. 
So one of the things I have to ask about is I know for your book, you did the audiobook version yourself, and you talked about that just being a really wonderful experience. Can you share what that was like and why you decided to do that? Oh, gosh. Well, for me, it was like kind of bringing it all back to where it began because you know people ask me growing up, did I know I wanted to be a broadcaster? I, I didn't even think about it. I didn't even think it was a possibility until I was in high school when my high school drama teacher, and I mentioned his name earlier, it's Mr. Barsoon at Jackson Baptist High School. He cast me as the narrator in all of our productions. Like I thought I was an actress. I wanted a, a main role. I wanted to show off my acting chops, but he continually cast me as the narrator. And the narrators in the productions really carried the entire production, carried the tone. They moved the audience through the production and closed it. And at first, I kind of begrudged him for casting me as the narrator. But then it was because of the role that I played in those productions and his feedback. That's the reason I went into broadcasting, because he said, you tell a great story. You have good inflection, intonation. You're engaging. You should go into broadcasting. And literally, that was the first time I even thought about it when he suggested it to me. And it was only because he cast me as the narrator, something I didn't want to do, but something that I grew to really love. And so it was because of him that I went into broadcasting. Fast forward, when I get to do the audio version of my book, it kind of just took me back to where it all began, where I kind of discovered these gifts that God gave me. And to get back in the booth, and I have tracked things and I guess, quote unquote, narrated throughout my broadcasting career. But to be able to narrate the audio version of my own book was really, it kind of came full circle for me. And it was emotional, especially there's one chapter in particular where I talk about, I dedicated the book to my father who died as during the writing of the book. And so chapter 11 was really, really tough for me to get through. I had to, that took a full day. I had to leave the studio a couple of times and, and come back. But it was all in all just a really, beautiful experience, so much so that I told one of my agents, I was like, I'd love to narrate books. I'd love to kind of get back to that. It takes me back to the love that I realized I first discovered. And it was how I first discovered kind of this niche in broadcasting. So it was a true honor. I loved it. So not everybody likes narrating their books, but... No, not everyone's good at it. Let's just say that. (laughs) If you want to write another book, Daniel, and you need me to narrate it, um, I'm happy to. Okay. Well, I'm holding that in my back pocket. <laughs> so I come up with a good idea. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about your podcast, Journeys in Faith. I mean, I listened to quite a few episodes preparing for this. Number one, you're an amazing interviewer. You just are so comfortable and natural. And so I feel like you're such a great conduit for people to engage with people. But the thing that attracted me to it is oh, I've had my own faith journey. I would not describe myself as a incredibly religious person, but I definitely have, you know, kind of spiritual practices that I that I do. But I also find that it's something, again, like you said, that anytime faith gets brought up, especially in, I don't know, like a, a public or you know, kind of media setting, it's silenced or edited out. And yet you've had people like Nikki Haley, Tim Tebow, Dave Ramsey, all people with very different backgrounds and journeys, as well as people who are atheists like Sam Harris on the podcast. What I've loved is that you engaged with it in a way that clearly you know, this was an important topic for you, but you wanted to give everybody a platform to be able to talk about it. Out of all those conversations, what stood out to you and what are some, I guess, incredible things that you've experienced and heard and felt as part of that journey? What I learned is you can be dogged and convicted in your own faith and still have really riveting, respectful conversations with people of other faiths. And all of that it does is it showed me that I need to show up as my true self. You need to show up as your true self. If you're Christian or Jewish or atheist, so often we're scared to show up as our true selves because we're frightened what people are going to think about us, what they're going to say. But the moment that you do and you show up as your true self in a very respectful manner, the next thing you know, you're having great conversations with other people who are encouraged to show up in as their true self. You have riveting conversations about what's important to them, cultures, traditions, faith. And it breaks down these walls of ignorance and naivete. And so often I think for me, I learned about other faiths. And it's not that we're disrespectful of other faiths. We just don't take the time to talk to people. It also showed me like I can love my faith and believe wholeheartedly in my faith. And I could still respect other people who believe differently. It doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make me wrong. I can believe what I believe wholeheartedly is the truth. And I can still be respectful and love people. 
I can sit down at a table and I learned this from doing the view too. I can see people for people and not people as policy, not people just as their religion. I can sit down and have a conversation with them and love them. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. They're made in the image of God and I can respect them and love them for that. Don't have to agree with them, but I can respect them at the end of the day enough to say, you can believe what you believe and I can believe what I believe. And guess what? We can still coexist. We can disagree without being totally disagreeable. And what was interesting is it only made my faith deepen. And I think if you haven't ever challenged your faith and haven't asked yourself some of those tough questions, I mean, I'm a journalist, so I think that some of that is just inherent. You know, I like to explore and I'm a skeptic at heart. I like to ask a lot of questions. But I think if you haven't, if you don't have an answer for the hope that is within you, you have to have an answer for the hope that is within you. Then I think that you need to really dig in and ask yourself some of those hard questions. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? How does it get you through the ups and downs? And people ask me all the time. And I think what's great about working in such a secular environment, people would challenge me all the time. And what that did was it forced me to dig in, to really research and explore and investigate. One of my favorite books is The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but that's been one of the most transformative books in my life, along with The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. I know, totally rando. But Lee Strobel was the former legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. And he was an atheist or agnostic. I can't remember which one, but his wife became a Christian. He thought she was a Looney Tune. So he went on this journey to basically disprove Jesus Christ. He put him on trial and he interviewed scientists, anthropologists, psychologists, the case for Christ. And it talks about his journey to becoming a Christian and asks some of those really deep theological questions that we all get posed as if you are a person of faith, if you are a Christian. But I just thought it was a really fascinating read. Again, you have to be ready to answer for the hope that's within you. It's not enough just to say, oh, this is how I was raised. Come on, we could do better than that. We could do a lot better. Yeah, you have to have your own answer for that, not a borrowed answer or your parents' answer or any of that. And I think more importantly, they'll know you're Christians by your love. I mean, you could talk the big game and you can have the theological answers to every question and you can be even an expert in apologetics, which my brother is. But If you don't have love, you have nothing. They're not going to listen to you unless you lead with love. They'll know you're Christians by your love for one another. So lead with love. And then when people notice that there's a difference about you, then they start asking, well, what's different about you? But if they can't tell from the external that there's something different, they're not going to care what you say. No, I definitely agree with that. I think you've got to, you have to be an example by which people can just intuitively ask questions about like, well, why are you amazing? You always show up this way. Why is that the case? And and then I feel like you've got something to really explore and talk about together as opposed to just kind of yelling at somebody your beliefs. <laughs> just, it just never works very well. <laughs> yelling. Believe this way. No, it doesn't. And don't throw names out there. And oh, if you truly believed you would do this or you would vote a certain way. Like, no. I mean, again, you can be convicted and dogged in your beliefs and still respect the other person. And they don't have to be wrong. You don't both have to be right. You don't both have to be wrong. So just like take care of your own sphere. Take care of yourself. Take care of your own house. Don't worry so much about the White House. You know, that's what I always say, you know. But yeah, just lead with respect and love. Yeah, I guess an episode that I wanted to share, like I mentioned, I listened to a few episodes of Journeys in Faith leading up to this. The one that really blew me away is Nikki Haley, you know, and I know I knew a little bit about her. I know people that are huge fans of hers. But I think what was really engaging and interesting about that interview is, number one, hearing all the difficult things that she's gone through, especially being governor of South Carolina and how important her faith was to get her through that, including dealing with PTSD. But I think it was just a it was a really intimate and personal angle to learn about somebody and to see really that this thing that, like you mentioned, is never discussed and is omitted and is edited out is actually a, you know, plays a huge role in her life and all of your your guest life. Is there a favorite interview or a favorite moment that you have from one of the episodes on the show? One of my favorite episodes was having my dear friends and my former co-anchor at Good Morning America, Dan Harris, and he hosts a really popular podcast, 10% Happier. And he describes himself as kind of like an agnostic Buddhist. And so, but Dan and I, I joke that I'm the little sister he never had nor wanted. Like we just have such a familial, warm vibe. He's like my big brother and I'm the annoying little sister. And we would have the most 
challenging religious faith conversations, debates. But loving, loving, challenging debates. (laughs) Off camera, very much so off camera. And he was one of my favorite podcasts just because I think just because of our relationship and our past and like, he's such a good human being and we don't see this, we don't have the same point of view when it comes to faith, but I respect him and he respects me and he knows that there's something different about me. So that's definitely one of my favorites, but they're all different in their own right. And I think just as an overarching takeaway was just seeing these people in a different light, seeing these newsmakers, whether it was Kellyanne Conway or Ben Shapiro or Sam Harris or Tim Tebow or Nikki Haley, like you said, or Deion Sanders, you know, we had some really great guests. I did a political series with some of the prominent Democrats and Republicans, Ted Cruz and Tim Scott and Marianne Williamson, who had some crazy policies that she was throwing out there, but like really interesting too. And Cory Booker, I'm just like trying to rattle off some names from season three. So it was important for me to have diverse ideology and diverse perspectives on there as well. But just really being able to see these people for people instead of just boiling them down and reducing them to their politics or their ideologies to kind of peel back the layers was really fascinating. So, and I'm excited. I was able to do three seasons of Journeys of Faith that, you know, with ABC and yeah, will we see another season or another incarnate something like that? You, you'll see something different. <laughs> I'll, there'll be a different podcast out there. So just put it that way. I can't really say much about it. It won't be Journeys of Faith. It won't be with ABC. But I'm excited to launch a new podcast soon. And it'll probably, it'll explore some of those tenets about purpose and calling and taking risks and people that have kind of reinvented themselves, second acts, that sort of thing, pressing to our fear, things that are kind of resonating in this moment where people are all reflecting on who they are and whether or not this is what they want for their life. So I'm excited to explore that. It'll be fun. I can't wait to see what that looks like. So one of the things that I really appreciated about your podcast and the way you engage there is number one, you clearly have, like I mentioned before, you have your own very strong point of view. You're a Christian, but you had people on the podcast from all walks of life, from all religious backgrounds, from all experiences. And you did an amazing job at having really genuine, open, compassionate conversations. And so one of the things I wanted to explore with you is just your roots in journalism. And I think your thoughts about what it takes to have a deep, nuanced conversation with somebody. And what are you, you know, in your mind when you sit down with someone and you know that there's all these really interesting ideas you want to explore, how do you go about navigating that conversation? And how do you think about what you're really doing as a journalist in those moments? Well, look, I think there's a, an element of just inherent curiosity from my perspective. I mean, my nickname was Paula 20 Questions. I've always been inherently curious. Yeah. What's the background on that nickname? <laughs> I was so annoying. I didn't stop asking questions and I didn't stop challenging people when I was little. I was the youngest of four. For instance, we had a close family friend. Her name was Judy Bartell. She would come over and she smoked. I was little. I am probably like six, seven years old. And every time she came over, I'd, can I look through your purse? And I would find her cigarettes and I'd be like, you know, these are going to kill you, right? So I was never afraid to ask questions or get in people's face. Two good skills. <laughs> From an early age. Um, but also being the youngest, I was the youngest cousin on both sides by a large margin. And I was a little annoying. I asked questions. I was persistent. And so I earned that moniker, which I think was meant to be negative. Paula, 20 questions just doesn't shut up. And then I, it kind of became who I was. I've used that as a strength in some capacities, but I think just my inherent curiosity. And I think you have to go into an interview, even if you're not interviewing, whether you're a CEO or you're a manager and you're interviewing people, you're interviewing potential employees, or you're just trying to have a conversation with somebody. I think if if they don't know that you care and have done the homework and research on them, they're not going to be engaged. I remember one of my first, when I was first interviewing at ABC, I went into an interview with one of the executives and I could tell they were looking at my resume for the very first time. So you're in Chicago, you know? So, cause I was, when I was interviewing, I was in Chicago at the time and I was interviewing on the East coast. And I still remember like that didn't make me feel 
it's not that you need to feel special, but you need to put the other person at ease in some capacity. And yes, you can still ask tough questions and you can challenge them, but they have to know that you've cared enough to do the research. So, and that you've cared enough to find out a little bit more about them. Like before I was getting ready to be interviewed by you and I'm not even the interviewer, I was doing some research on you and found out a little bit about what makes you tick because I think that's important even in a conversation to know, ask questions, to know about the other person on the the other side of the table. So A, that's the most important thing is doing your research, showing you care that you know about that person and that you want to know more. And then B, just listening. And once you can do those two things, you're going to find the person on the other side of the table, whether it's in an interview setting for a job or in a professional interview, you're going to find that that person's going to open up. And one other tactic that I learned from Chris Voss, I don't know if you've read his books, Never Split the Difference. Chris Voss was, I had to interview him a couple of years ago at the Global Leadership Summit. And he was the former lead hostage negotiator for the FBI. Okay, so he's in some of the most hostile environments. And he says that we're we're in negotiations every day that we don't even know. But one of his tactics, it's called mirroring. So what you do is if you want the other person to open up, you literally repeat the last three words that the person said. So it's just say something to me like. Well, just makes me think about Michael Scott because I know he are, I feel like in the office, there's a few scenes where mirroring's involved and it's a little, a little creepy. (laughs) So, and you just said it's creepy. It's creepy. Tell me about that. So you're literally just repeating the last three words and what that does, A, it shows them that you're caring, that you're listening, but it gets them to keep giving a little bit more on that and to keep opening up. Yeah, I know even just restating, that's something I've tried to get better at recently as well too is, so a lot of what I do during the day is, you know, I'm in meetings with my team at Flow and we're doing all the things we need to do to continue to kind of operate the business and and grow the business. And inevitably what a lot of that looks like is really just trying to understand, I think, you know, what a CEO is at the end of the day, a lot of the times is somebody that needs to understand everyone's point of view on the team and be able to get all those people to move in one direction as one team. And a big part of that's simply just listening. And so I feel like one skill I've tried to get better at recently is, which in my mind is like, you know, I make it a point to really try to make people feel heard and really try to be present in meetings. But I think one way that's helpful is just to restate what people say. So say, you know, I think this is what I heard you say. Is this really what, you know, is this what you were meaning or is this how you feel? And I found that that's really powerful because number one, it does, I think in our world today, people often don't feel heard. They don't know if you're really paying attention. We don't know if anyone's paying attention half the time when we're talking or sharing our thoughts or even on a phone call with somebody else. And so it makes people feel heard. But I think another is, everybody likes to feel like they're important and it makes people feel like they're important, which is a great skill. And I think that's why we're kind of in the situation we're in. Everybody lives in a fence and it's just, everybody wants to feel unique and special. They want to feel heard and people don't feel heard in this moment because there's so much clamoring for their attention. I think it's great the type of environment you've tried to create. And as a leader, I think we're all leaders because we all have influence. I feel like my leadership style is kind of copied. I've tried to find what's worked for other people. It's a culmination of what I've learned along, same with my parenting. It's like, I didn't figure it out. Other people that were doing it took bits and pieces. And so one thing that I'm trying to really apply now that I'm forming a company, which I can't really talk about yet, but you'll find out more in the spring of 2021. When I was interviewing Beth Comstock and I was interviewing her for, again, the Global Leadership Summit, which I'm really involved in, She is one of the former chairs. I think she was the first female chair at General Electric. And she was also an executive at NBC Universal. And so I was interviewing her about her leadership style. And one thing that I really took from her, she would ask her people, once a month, I want you to tell me something I don't want to hear. And what that did was it opened the lines of communication, but it made people, A, like you said, feel heard. And it also established this atmosphere of transparency and honesty where people felt that they had a voice, that they had a say, and that they were heard. And I thought that that was, that's something that I'm trying to implement into my own leadership journey, asking the people on the team, on my team, what's one thing I don't want to hear? Because I want them to know that this is, we're a team. We are a team. There might be a structural hierarchy, but we're a team at the end of the day. And that's the way that you build not just an honest culture, but a really strong culture where 
people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. I know working for other leaders who made me feel part of, like I was part of it and they saw something in me that I didn't see for myself and they shared their vision and they believed in me. I wanted to run through a wall for those leaders. That's the kind of environment that I want to establish too. And I think that's a really good question that we can all fold into our own leadership. Tell me one thing I don't want to hear. It can be painful. I think it's amazing because I think the only way you're ever going to improve is by being aware of and making it okay and making it comfortable and actually good for people to bring up those things. And it's not that, you know, it's going to feel great. I'm sure it probably always stings a little bit when people share those things, but that's the only way you're going to make progress (laughs) by talking. And how often do we see abuse of power, abuse of leadership, where leaders have surrounded themselves with yes men and yes women and enablers? And then what that does, it creates this dictatorship. It creates an air of dishonesty. And also like, I need somebody to save me from myself because I can get in my own way. I want people to challenge me and to call me out when I respectfully, when I need to be called out. Because that's the thing as leaders, like we have to be confident enough and secure enough in ourselves that we've assembled a team that feels that they have a say and has a voice and that they're part of something bigger than themselves. And again, I need to be safe for myself a lot. I really do. Well, and I'm so glad you touched on that because I feel like one of the most challenging parts about getting better as a leader is really just leaning into and understanding the things that you don't do well and knowing and being, being aware of those things and knowing how to offset them. And I find that the best leaders have put more work into themselves than necessarily than the business or than their team. Because I think if you have issues or things you're struggling with, or you don't want to hear difficult news, or you need people to build you up constantly, those things are all going to show up negatively in the way that you lead and in the way that your team interacts with one another. And so I feel like, you know, one of the, it's maybe an indirect path, but one of the ways to become a better leader is just to really work on yourself and know yourself. No, that's really great. I haven't heard it put that way. And I think that that's something that's really valuable that I could fold into my own leadership style and leadership journey. Because as the leader of a company, I mean, you set the tone. And that's the thing. You've surrounded yourself with people who fill in the gaps. I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. And I'm not trying to like, and I think that a strength is identifying your weaknesses and making sure that you have people that fit those gaps and fill those gaps. And they know that they are empowered You're in this space because I can't do this alone. I need you in this space and I'm delegating to you and I'm entrusting you. Yeah, I think part of leading is just managing but motivating people. And you're right. If I'm investing in myself and my own leadership style, I don't have to be all things to all people and do all things. That's why you've hired really kick-ass people on your team. And they need to know that. That's a myth. No one is all things to all people, good at all. That's not a thing. (laughs) I am so bad. And I I think I was mentioning to you earlier, like I couldn't even figure out how to save a PDF on my desktop (laughs) yesterday with, with my team. And I was like, guys, I think I need to go to like technology 101. But then again, I was like, but that's why I have all of you. Like I don't, I'm never going to claim that I am technologically literate because I'm not, I don't want to be though. (laughs) Cause I, I just, that's just not my wheelhouse. But that's why I've got you. I've got you guys on my team to help me with this, but also to carry that load. This is a weakness of mine. And that's why you're in place and I believe in you. And that's why you're in this position. And I'm not trying to be all things to all people. I know where my strengths lie and I'm going to focus on those. And this is where your strength is. And you are a huge part and crucial to the team as we all are. We're like, we all have to have the baton at certain times, not one person with the baton at all times. Yeah, that's a quote that's constantly just been rolling around in my mind is just this idea that great idea or great things are always built by a great team. I do really think, I think obviously, you know, now we've got a resurgence in superhero movies and I think everybody wants to see themselves as the person that can do it all and be it all. But I think that that's not reality in that it really does take you knowing your limitations, knowing what you're good at. And, you know, I think you shared a great rubric for figuring that out earlier, just going through those three questions, you know, to really understand like what is your area of genius and then knowing how to offset that by finding really talented people that are good at the things that you're not or the things that drain energy from you or the things that, you know, when you're doing it, you're clearly like, this is not what I'm called to do. And I think that's one of those great 
tools that you can use on your team, whether or not you like issue the Enneagram test to find out what people's strengths and weaknesses are, but also maybe applying those three questions to everybody on your team. Okay, let's sit down. Let's work through this together. What are we good at? What do we love? And what other people notice we're good at and we love? And then what that does is it unleashes those talents and gifts within each person on your team to kind of live up to that potential. Well, I want you to use your talents and gifts of fixing things. I want you to use those on this team. That's where I'm really relying on you. Your inherent talents and gifts, which you're good at and love, your curiosity, let's focus on that. Let's build into that. That's why you're on this team. So I love that wording too. It's not, I want you to do this. It's take your talents and gifts because you're uniquely good at this. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this is your unique DNA code. This is not mine. And I think just really playing up people's strengths instead of focusing on the weaknesses, this is what you bring to the table uniquely. This is how you're wired and this is where I want you to shine in this area. My brother-in-law loves to fix things and he's a surgeon, but he also has a farm and loves to like tinker in his garage and fix his tools and just fix everything around the house. So I think it's interesting how his gift of just wanting to fix things and people have manifest themselves. And I was like, he doesn't want to be a surgeon and a doctor for the rest of his life. He can use those gifts of inherent talents and gifts of wanting to fix things and people in different branches and in different capacities, different seasons of life. So I want to ask a couple of closing questions. And one of them is just for things that they do every single day. These could be rituals. This could be before I get up, I think about the things that I'm grateful for. So the little practices day in and day out that help them show up as their best selves. Can you share some of your practices? Yes. Well, I, to this morning I slept in. <laughs> it's a good practice too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am up with my kids every morning. I'm in a new season where I really want to be present with my children. And I've never been able to do that because I worked in morning television. So I've never been able to take them to school, rarely been able to pick them up. So I get up early most mornings and I'm having great conversation with them over breakfast. I like to get one thing that helps me is I get everything ready the night before. So like I even put out the bowls for cereal and their spoon and their glass for orange juice so that I can kind of invest in that time. Like, honestly, I know that sounds stupid, but I get all three of their water bottles out to fill them up. I get everything that I need for the next morning, cereal boxes, the bowls, everything, lay it out so that I can actually enjoy that a little bit more because we all know like getting your kids out the door is like hell. It's a window into what hell is going to be like. So I try to enjoy that moment and prepare for it a little bit more. This morning, I wanted to sleep in. Yesterday was my birthday. And I told my husband, I said, I want to sleep in this morning. So, but that that is one of the things that I'm really focused on in this season. And also my mental health. I'll be honest. I think all of us have been affected in some way, in some capacity. I'm a very positive person, but even I've been affected by all of the change. And so I needed to start focusing on my mental health. And for me, that looked like a couple of different things, but mainly I needed to work out. And so I joined CrossFit, which I never thought I would do. I am not a meathead. Okay. I hate working out. But I needed to get out of the house every day. So I drop my kids off at school and I go to the gym. And what it has provided is some structure for me. Like, I wish I could take a before and after shot, not of my physique. I don't really care so much what my physical body looks like. It's how I feel. I wish you could take a before and after of how I feel after I've worked out. And I feel like a new person. For me, it's been radical in my emotional health and my mental health, in my physical health. And That's what I'm trying to focus on in this season. I can't do everything for every single person. And as you said, like good leaders invest in themselves. If I'm better, if if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? I'm trying to invest in myself. And so it's been the best thing that I have done in this season has been to do CrossFit. And yeah, working out really hard. And it's not a crazy meathead CrossFit gym. And I just love the team atmosphere, the vibe where everybody's cheering one another on, you know, I can't lift a lot, but that's okay. We're all in it together and we're pushing one another and encouraging one another. And I just feel so strong, not like I can bench press strong, but I just feel strong as a human being after I work out. There's a lot to be said. So I agree. I feel like my willpower is higher. I feel like I'm more optimistic. I'm more excited and more energetic, which is kind of funny because you've just expended a bunch of energy and worked out really hard. But 
Totally. And I wasn't able to do, I was, I've never been able to work out in the morning because when I was anchoring GMA weekends, I would get up at 3 a.m. I'm not getting up at 2 a.m. to work out. I've never been able to work out in the morning and my schedule might change in the next couple of seasons. But for now, this is what I'm investing in. I'm investing in this season of my life. I am in a season where I'm really trying to focus on being present with my children and being the best version of myself that I can be, realizing that things can change. Like I said, vocation changes throughout our lives. We're called to do different things at different times. We don't have to be one thing. And so this chapter, this season of my life, I'm really trying to be strong mentally, physically, and emotionally for my family. Yeah. And take care of yourself, which is super important. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I guess you're right. I didn't realize when you said good leaders take care of themselves, like I am taking care of myself. I am eating Chick-fil-A just about every day too. <laughs> so it's another way of justifying my Chick-fil-A habit. That's what I asked for my birthday dinner. My husband said, what do you want? And I said, Chick-fil-A. I mean, we love Chick-fil-A. It's, it's hard not to love Chick-fil-A. <laughs> it's God's chicken. There's no calories in it. <laughs> None at all. Not in any of the breading, not in any of the buns. No. I usually get the grilled nugs and a large fry and a large drink. So... Well, that sounds pretty good. Okay, one more closing question. We ask every guest to share a person or experience that has just really shaped them. And you talked earlier about your father and how you dedicated a chapter to him. Is there a person or experience that you can share that you continue to hold with you and you just hold really near and dear? With my dad, yeah. I He was a genius. He is an electrical engineer, but a man of insecurities and a man who was trying to find out who he was outside of what he did. And for so long, he was chasing success, which looked like one thing and experimenting with transcendental meditation and Valium. And he f- didn't find peace until he found his faith and is when he was in his 40s. And that's when I entered the picture. And the dad that I grew up with, and you don't necessarily realize this until you're older. And you know, for me, I didn't really truly appreciated until I saw my dad in the last moments of his life. And this is a person who prioritized being home and being present for dinner. And he had plenty of opportunities to move up the corporate ladder. And I'm not saying that there's something, there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody has to make their own decisions. But for him, he knew who he was outside of what he did. And he wanted to invest in people and invest in his family and use his gifts and talents and gifts that God gave him and really focus on the type of person that he was, not just the what he did, you know, just his vocation. And so I saw him just sewing into people and investing in people, investing in his family. And he unfortunately had a debilitating stroke in the summer of 2018. And in August of 2018, and he was paralyzed on one side, he couldn't eat, he couldn't swallow, he couldn't speak, couldn't even drink water. And so my dad, from August to February, just withered away. You know, he lost 60 pounds. And by the time he died, and it was really tough to see him suffer like that. But he was surrounded by friends and family every day. And I think that was just a testament to the life that he lived. And But the facilities that he was in and being cared for, many of the occupants would get one visitor a month. My dad had people on a daily basis visiting him. And The week before he died, it was a Saturday, and he slipped into a coma that night, and then he died the day after Valentine's Day. And that day was was a bunch of my cousins were in the room, and the family, we were all there just holding watch with him. And and remember, he couldn't really, he couldn't speak, he could nod, and you could actually understand what he was saying when he was angry because it tapped into a different part of his brain, which is really interesting and fascinating. But this particular day, and this is the very last conversation that I had with my dad, and this is what I'll always take away from who my dad was. He was crying that day, and he was crying routinely because he was in so much pain because his body was shutting down, his body was atrophying, he lost 60 pounds within a matter of August to February. And I said, Daddy, are you crying because you're sad? And he shook his head no. And I said, Dad, are you crying because you're in because you're in pain? He shook his head no. And I said, Are you crying because you're surrounded by love and memories and the people in this room? And he shook his head yes. And I said, That's the type of life that I want to live. That's the legacy of my father. That's the type of life I want to live for my family and my friends. It just put everything in perspective. And that's the very last conversation that I had with my dad. It's a beautiful last moment. Yeah. And he slipped into a coma that night and passed away the day after Valentine's Day. And 
his gravestone says nothing about what he did. It was the type of person he was. And I just thank my dad for that gift of perspective and of realizing what's consequential and what's not consequential and what's inconsequential rather. So it's the type of life I want to live. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And that's why I dedicated my book to my father. So he was a flawed man like we all are, but he really settled into the type of person he wanted to be. And when death came calling, he had no regrets. He was overwhelmed by the type of life that he lived. And that's the type of life that I want to live and the type of life that I want to encourage other people to live. And that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Paul. This has been an incredible conversation. Thank you, Daniel. And do I have to send the gaming headset back because my son's going to be disappointed? You can maybe give that to your son. We can talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) He would appreciate it, clearly. (laughs) Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to everything mentioned in this episode, visit danielscrivener.com. There you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter, where each week I send out a single email with all of the best quotes, themes, and ideas from the latest episode. To sign up for that, visit danielscrivener.com slash email. Just one more thing before you take off. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Great reviews help us land great guests. So if you've enjoyed this episode, take 30 seconds to leave a short review. We would so appreciate it. Thank you so much. 